All right, we're going to uh, pick up our study of the book of Acts in the ninth chapter, Acts chapter 9. Actually, uh, chapters 9 and 10 are pretty lengthy. Got uh, about 90 verses in these two chapters, so we'll be spend a little bit of time. But remember this, as we read through the book of Acts, we're reading a history. So it's, it's more like reading a story. We're not spending a lot of time like we would maybe studying Ephesians or the book of Galatians or Romans where we're starting to pick apart theological terms and things like that. This is a story, and we're going to get more deeply into the story of Saul. Remember this, the text of the story of the book of Acts is included in your notes. That's done purposely, so you can take the notebook and you could actually study it don't have to carry your six-inch thick Bible with you wherever you go, but you could take your notes and you'd have your text there. We're going to do about a 30-minute uh, segment right now. That's what we're aiming at, 30 to 35 minutes to get through this. The book of Acts covers about 35 years of history, say, uh, say 30 A.D. to maybe 65 A.D., somewhere in the neighborhood of that. And as I said, it's primarily historical and transitional. It uh, chronicles the Acts of the Apostles. That's where the name comes from, the actions of the Apostles in the early church. It tells us how things actually got started. The book of Acts picks up where the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where they leave off. Uh, the book is transitional, as I said. It takes us uh, from a very... Um, Jewish kingdom-centered uh, theology uh, from the book of Matthew and back into the Old Testament, takes us into the New Testament, the book of Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, etc., etc. The, in the beginning of the book, we see uh, the, the uh, geographical area that's uh, focused on is the city of Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus told the disciples to, uh, that there'll be witnesses unto him to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part. And we see in the book of Acts that commission actually develop. It starts in Jerusalem through the first several chapters of the book. It moves to Judea, Samaria, and then by the time we get to chapter 13, we're going to the uttermost part of the earth. The uh, key figure in the first few chapters is uh, the apostle Peter, by the time we get to chapter 9, we see the conversion of Paul, Saul, and in chapter number 13, then the main figure of the book becomes the Apostle Paul. So let's pick things up. On page 123 in your notebook, if you would, we'll follow along the notebook just so you don't and I don't get lost. But I quoted a passage of Scripture here from the Old Testament, from the book of Ecclesiastes, that says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Loneliness is a uh, problem for a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in this world. They may be surrounded by people, but they feel very much alone. And here in this uh, particular chapter, we see Saul, who has been attacking Christians. Uh, he was introduced at the end of chapter 7, chapter 8. Now as we get into chapter 9, we see the conversion of Saul, who in chapter 13, I believe it is, he is uh, called Paul at that point. But we see his conversion. But you can just imagine from the time he was converted in chapter 9 to the time uh, he was accepted into Christianity as we understand it, that there were some lonely periods of time. He was caught in between. He had been very, um, uh, very much involved, very radical as far as his, his belief in Judaism as a Pharisee and all that in defense of what he grew up to believe to be true. And uh, by the time this new way, this Christian movement comes along, he's very upset very radical, fighting uh, tooth and nail against these heretics who are claiming that this Jesus person is, is their Messiah and the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophets and prophecies about him. So um, 
We've entitled this in our notebook, If They Fall, the One Will Lift Up His Fellow. And, and so there's a focus in this chapter on the importance of people loving people. And uh, although you may not like people, some people don't. They just are not good people people. Some people are like that. You may be that way, but we all need people. Is uh, John Donne said, no man is an island. And uh, this quotation from him has got a couple, couple uh, quotations, a couple statements. They're very, very well known. Uh, no man is an island. And then for whom the bell tolls by John Donne. Read through that if you get a chance. Donne is referring to the human condition. It needs interaction with other people. Uh, there's a big word, gregariousness. We are made, born, to be a person among people, to depend upon people, to love people, to associate with other people. In fact, it's debilitating when people are left alone. I think of elderly people who have been tucked away somewhere in a nursing home, and I visited many times folks like that, and um, the mood uh, that surrounds them, the depression when their family doesn't visit with them, and people don't uh, take the time of day to converse with them, and they're just kind of left to themselves waiting for the ultimate event, their death, and uh, what, a, what a, a terrible time in a person's life to be left alone that way. Remember that. You have elderly uh, members like myself and your family, you have people like that, don't neglect them. Don't just... Uh, push them aside, get them out of your life. They're, don't do that to them. Make sure that you're a friend to them. I notice in the middle of the page, before we show the outline, everyone needs three things, and it really goes back to the thoughts that I've just given to you. So we, need to, we need the truth. Everybody is looking for the truth. What is right? What is wrong? What, uh, what represents reality. That's what the truth is. And then people need hope. They need hope for, the, for another day. You don't want to come to the end of yourself and, and think, you know, tomorrow is going to be worse than today. I think that's what drives people to consider taking their own life when they look at uh, the rest of their life or what they think is the rest of their life and they say, there is nothing good coming down this uh, road for me. Tomorrow is going to be worse than today. And I think people certainly are tempted if they don't end their life then. But the last thing on this list is everybody's looking for someone to love. I really believe that, that part of our makeup is we need to love people and we need people to love us. Now, it may come in reverse order. We may not love people until we feel loved ourselves. Of course, that goes back to our selfish nature. But the point of all of this is the importance of fellowship. So I see that here in chapter number 9 up through the first 30 verses or so. You see at the bottom of page 123, you see the outline of the chapter. I won't read that to you, but we always put that in there. I do this for my benefit. This, this helps me know that I've got the general storyline. I want to know the context of what I'm talking about. So basically, I've divided this uh, chapter, or this, this section, actually the first 31 verses, I've divided up into seven major thoughts that you can focus your attention on. So the first one is Saul wages war on the disciples. We read in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Like I said, Paul, Saul, was a fanatic. He was radical. He was, he was set on fighting this uh, heretical, as far as he was concerned, movement, these people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, when the evidence was quite to the contrary. Now, if there was anybody that uh, knew 
you should have known the Old Testament, it would be a Pharisee. Pharisees were very conservative in their belief, very orthodox in their belief. But he was so loyal to the system that he missed, like so many Jews, he missed the theological clues that were given in prophecies all through the Old Testament and failed to examine the life of Christ and actually what he said and what he did. And consequently, like so many, they just missed the boat at that time. However, once he got it, once he realized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those promises, he was just as radical on the other side as he was when he was opposing Christianity. He became maybe the most radical and militant, fundamental, Bible-believing Christian that has ever existed, ever lived. Uh, and I've heard many a preacher refer to him as that. Uh, the only person that would supersede him would be the Lord Jesus himself. Well, we saw Paul in introduced earlier, as we've said, and we uh, noted that his name, there's a name change in chapter 13, verse number 9. Why it was changed would be uh, just uh, speculation. I can't tell you. The Bible doesn't say exactly, but there's some good reasons for that. You see his, his militancy. He desired letters. He wanted the authority to confront these Christians, and if he found them, to drag them a hundred plus miles back to Jerusalem and have them dealt with by the religious, um, religious, religious leaders of Israel. Notice the phrase, this way, in verse number two. That term comes up several times throughout the book of Acts. Saul then is thrown to the ground and blinded, verse 3 of chapter 9, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. I suppose if one were to lose his eyesight so quickly under such extreme circumstances, it would serve to take your appetite away, no doubt, no doubt at all. 9.3, suddenly there shined. The conversion of Saul is recorded in two other places. It's interesting to compare the three accounts. You'll find another account in chapter 22, another account in chapter number 26 of the book of Acts. And just to see some of the details that are included in one account and are not in another. But uh, that's a good exercise for you to do uh, sometime. He fell to the earth. He was uh, knocked off high horse. Pride goeth before destruction. And no doubt, Paul's problem, or part of Paul's problem in his militancy was his arrogance. He was an arrogant, prideful, um, purposeful individual. He believed he knew what was right, and he was going to pursue it to the nth degree. Proverbs 29 says, a man's pride shall bring him low. And then the voice, the voice of Christ says, why are you persecuting me? The question then is asked by Paul, who art thou, Lord? I mean, that's where that's where conversion starts. Who is God? You've got to believe in the Lord first. You've got to believe that, um, what is it, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that you have to believe that uh, he, that he uh, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that he exists, that God is a reality. Who art thou, Lord? Why are you kicking against the pricks? The image is uh, uh, a goad you know, a stick that's being stuck into an animal to try to get that 
animal to move. Or maybe uh, we would think of uh, someone riding a horse and they'd have the reins and they'd be using the reins to, you know, uh, maybe uh, whip the horse. I mean, I don't mean that in a, you know, a, a, a damaging way, but to get the horse's attention, to get the horse to move. Why are you kicking against the pricks? And then he asks another question. I think this is a great question. This is the first question that I asked after I got saved. When I confessed Christ as Savior back in 1972, I prayed. I really believed that I understood what I was doing. This wasn't a split-second decision. The fellow had been witnessing to me for several weeks uh, off and on. And when I prayed and felt that I really understood what uh, I was doing, I remember at the end of the prayer, I looked up and I looked into the face of the fellow that led me to Christ, and I said, now what do I do? In other words, what's the next step? I think that's a logical question for anybody who's truly saved. It bothers me when people claim salvation but do not have any desire to find out, now what? Now what should I do? I think that the Holy Spirit of God plants that deep within the soul of the believer at the new birth the question is planted in your heart and your soul now what now what do you want me to do what's the logical result or consequence of this decision that i have made he was blinded he was humbled he was a broken man he was knocked off his horse three days without food and water he probably was in some kind of spiritual and psychological shock from all of this that had happened. Of course, he had three days now to stop and examine his life, or re-examine his life. What have I been doing? I've made some serious mistakes in errors in judgment. So we go down to verse number 10 of chapter number 9, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. This is another Ananias other than the one that showed up in chapter 5. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, I guess so. He's been blind for three days and still thinking about this, this uh, experience that he's gone through. He prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias, you, coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man. <laughs> this is Paul or Saul's reputation. I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Important to note, you know, we think of Paul the Apostle as the Apostle to the, um, to the Gentiles, but as you go through the book of Acts, the latter chapters, once he goes on his missionary journeys, you'll see that Paul always sought Jews out. He always, uh, it seems like his first stop in any town that he went, he went to the synagogue. He was looking for Jews. And you might think that that was somewhat out of order, but it wasn't. Notice what it says here in verse 15. He was to be a chosen vessel before the Gentiles, that's number one, kings. We see that he goes before political officials, and ultimately we believe that he had an opportunity to appeal to Caesar in Rome, and then it says in the children of Israel. So he was never told not to witness to Jews. It's not like Peter had one job, he's the apostle to Jews, and Paul is the apostle to Gentiles. You don't have to separate the population out and say, you know, I'm only going to witness to males who are 30 years old and older, 
or I'm going to witness to females who are whatever, or I'm only going to witness to people who are married, or I'm only going to witness to people who are of Polish descent or whatever it is. No, we're to be witnesses to everyone. And Paul was to be a witness to Gentiles. He was to be a witness. He had the privilege of going before kings. And because of his background, he still was given the privilege and the responsibility to talk to the children of Israel. Jesus continues in verse 16, and he says, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul did suffer. You can read that in 2 Corinthians. I think it's chapter 11. He has a long list of, uh, a list of difficult uh, experiences that he went through himself. Check that out when you get a chance. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hand on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hast sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So, uh, it is uh, reticent, good word, that Ananias is to have anything to do with the, this man named Saul. He does what he is asked to do, even though he has human fears because of the reputation of Saul. And he does exactly what the Lord has asked him to do. I like that Ananias was available. There's a couple things, many things that are important for us to be good Christian people, but two of the greatest are teachability and availability. We've got to be willing to learn and not have a know-it-all attitude. We have to have a, a desire to learn, to be a lifelong learner as a Christian. And then to make ourselves more than just a student, but to make ourselves uh, an individual who's actually serving and working in the ministry, being available. Teachable and available, both are important. Page 126, Saul has seen a vision. Ananias, Saul's expecting you. And so God is orchestrating this whole set of circumstances. Remember, we emphasize at the beginning of this session here, we emphasize loneliness. Imagine where Saul is right now. He's been told by Jesus that you have made a big mistake. You've not only been wasting your life, but you have been going against the Messiah in the revelation, the, the summation and revelation of the whole Old Testament. You've been fighting this thing. You talk Now, he, he doesn't have a friend anywhere. He doesn't have a Christian friend Ananias certainly isn't excited about being his friend other than the fact that he's doing what he's called to do. And if the Jews only knew, if the scribes and Pharisees only knew what was going on in Saul's life, he certainly didn't have any friends there either. Well, he's a chosen vessel unto me. He's going to suffer. And then notice in verse 17, Brother Saul this uh, indicates that at this point, uh, most likely, although the brother could be a reference to a fellow Jew, but quite likely that at this point he is saved and he is getting his, uh, his marching orders, so to speak, to go into the ministry. So he's converted, baptized, he preaches Christ. In verse 18, we read, and immediately there fell from his eyes, immediately, Healing, immediately, um, healing, immediately, healing, immediately. How many times does that need to be said? We don't see that kind of healing taking place in these modern-day healing meetings that are going on. Immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose, arose and was baptized. So we are assuming that he's converted at this point. And baptism follows that decision to follow the Lord and trust Him as Savior. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Remember, he, had, he hadn't had food and water for three days. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Saul is looking for a new group of friends. I remember 
it wasn't, doesn't seem that long ago now. I guess it's just so vivid in my memory. But I remember after my wife and I, we got saved within a couple weeks of one another. We had a lot of friends, a lot of social friends, people that we worked with and people that we did sports and entertainment things and you name it. We had friends, family members like you all do. But I remember we had a burden to begin to tell them of what had happened to us. And we thought, we were so naive, we thought people would be excited, just as excited as we were. Of course, we weren't that excited when we first heard about it. At least I wasn't. My wife was. My wife was much more receptive to the message of the gospel than I was when first heard. I was polite. I listened politely, hoping that the fellow would go away and ultimately he would leave me alone so I could get on with my life and enjoy myself. Well, we found that once we trusted Christ as Savior, we started getting involved in the church and we started talking about Christ and we invited people to come with us to church. We saw our friend pool rapidly diminish. And probably over the next, I know over the next six months, you know, I'm not going to say that we lost them as friends, but we had much less to do with them and vice versa than they did with us. We never rejected them. We wanted to invite them into the new life that we had. And um, it wasn't that we were involved in immoral or illegal practices before that. And we fought with them, with our friends, and finally just had to reject them. It was just that our interests, our focus, the things that were important to us before weren't nearly as important to us any longer. Well, anyway, he was strengthened, straightway preached Christ, verse 20, 9, 20, in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it? He's preaching in the synagogues now, that he, that Jesus is the Son of God, but all that heard him were amazed and said, is that not this he that destroyed them which called them in the name of Jerusalem? What a reputation he had. Ananias had every reason to fear this fella. Notice, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on the name, on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Isn't this what, I mean, his whole act was looking for people who had uh, betrayed their Judaism so he could drag them off to the priests and have them whipped, beaten, incarcerated, or whatever it was on uh, <laughs> religious uh, accusations. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very truly Christ. Saul was the right man at the right time. Saul had a wonderful and thorough education in Judaism. He understood the Old Testament law. He understood the prophets. And as militant and as radical as he was prior to meeting Christ, he became just as militant and just as radical for Jesus Christ after he met him. And those that would contend with him, argue with him, theological terms and, and, and um, just the whole logic of who Christ was from the Old Testament. Paul knew what he was talking about and they had a difficult time dealing with his logic and the facts and his references to the Old Testament. He received his sight, he arose, he was baptized as I said, Acts is a transitional book. We have to be careful trying to prove any mechanical list of certain things that must happen for a person to be saved. I don't think that's what the book of Acts is really all about because we see such a variety of different conversion experiences there. Uh, straightway he preached. He preached Christ. That is so important. He preached Christ. And Saul just he's made a 180 degree turnaround he's going in the absolute opposite direction that he was going before this is the result of true 
Repentance. That's what repentance is. It's a turnaround. You're going this way, and you stop, and you say, wait a second, I'm wrong. This is not the right thing to do. And you turn around 180 degrees, and you go forward. Just as militant as you were for your sinfulness as a lost individual, you ought to be just as radical and just as militant for the truth of Jesus Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ as a Christian. And I think, I think when you look at people's personalities, I see that happen often. I'm from a Roman Catholic background, and I was pretty, pretty steeped in Roman Catholicism. I wasn't just a casual Catholic. I was involved. I believed. I followed the rules, the regulations, the rights of Catholicism. But when I understood the difference of where I was as a Catholic and my attitude towards Scripture and towards myself, when I trusted Christ as Savior, I got involved. I wanted to be involved. I was involved as a Catholic. I became involved as a Christian. I find that often. Let's look here and In uh, verse number 23, it says, I'm on page 127 in the notes, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. It's good to have friends. And Paul the Apostle needed friends. He lost not only not only were his, uh, uh, did his friends abandon him, but they literally became his enemies. It says that they sought to kill him. You talk about radical people. They laid in wait. They wanted to ambush him and kill him. So Paul had gained a whole new group of friends. I hope you've done that since you've become a Christian. It is incumbent upon you to seek new friends. I know that we think that we ought to walk into the church and everybody ought to just say, oh, we're so glad that you finally come over to our side. And why don't you come over to my house for dinner? And how much money would you like to borrow? And would you like to use my car tonight? We have this feeling like we ought to be so welcomed. And by the way, it's not not wrong. I would hope churches are like that, welcoming of new people. But as a new Christian... The new Christian, a man that hath friends, must show himself friendly. So both sides, the newborn Christian and then the mature Christians, who should know better, need to reach out to one another to begin to bond with one another. But we notice that the Jews took counsel to kill him, but the disciples took him and protected him. And... um, if I'm in the middle of page 127 where it says, in fact, note the next several verses, those who came to Paul's aid. He got a whole new group of friends. And we need friends. The people in your church need friends. They, they, you just can't show up for church, find your seat, sit down, and then you know, go to sleep and wait for the service to begin and end and then leave. We need to welcome one another. People need to feel comfortable when they walk in. They need to feel like they belong. Remember, everybody's seeking truth, everybody's seeking hope, and everybody's seeking love, affection. Not only someone to love, that's part of it, but they're looking for someone to love them. Let me finish this up here. Look at verses 26 through 29. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he attempted, or essayed, that's what the word means, to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Of course they were. (laughs) His reputation was he destroyed people. But they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. So he shared Paul's testimony with these people. And that he, the Lord, had spoken to him, Paul, and how he had preached boldly Christ, 
we saw that, at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in, going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. They went about to slay him. If you move to the bottom of the page, the bottom of page 127, coming in and going out at Jerusalem, it appears that Paul was able to spend a significant amount of time with the apostles. Remember the persecution of Acts chapter 8 had scattered the young church, except the apostles. They remained in Jerusalem. Now the conversion of Paul, which, verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then he had, then had the churches rest through all, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. This Paul, this Saul, was such an imposing threatening and powerful and authoritative individual that the church, generally speaking, was brought to rest when this fella went through his conversion experience. He was a one-man wrecking crew to the degree that he was militant for Judaism and for his heritage and for his traditions. He became just as militant and just as radical for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Several things written in our conclusion. When it comes to sharing the gospel with others, don't write anybody off. Even Paul the Saul's can be converted. What will you have me to do? That's a good question. It's the appropriate question of a born-again Christian. Ananias as fearful as he was, came alongside Paul during his initial transition to meet his needs and encourage him. We all need people to bring us in to the fellowship of the church, the fellowship of Christianity. He was God's chosen instrument to the Gentiles, to kings, and also to the nation of Israel. And notice, he was a mouthpiece. He was a witness the mission is simply the distribution of a message. In verse 20, he preached Christ, and that's who we preach. Every Christian needs a complement of like-minded believers to help him or her penetrate, integrate, and amalgamate with the body of Christ. Everyone is looking for three things. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about faith, hope, and charity. They kind of line up. Everybody's looking for truth, everybody's looking for hope, and everybody's looking for love. And maybe not to the same degree, somebody to love. So let's take a break right now. We've gone about 37 minutes or so, 36 minutes in this session. We'll come back in just a little bit, and we'll pick up in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. Take a break.